Well, welcome every morning and uh, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us this morning for this event on counterterrorism in Yemen. Uh, it will not come as a surprise to anyone in this room that Yemen has become an increasingly uh, visible security challenge for the United States over the, the past year. Uh, that is in large part because of its uh, status as a weakly governed country, one uh, in which al-Qaeda uh, is seeming to gain uh, some momentum. Uh, the one response to this has been increased attention to Yemen from the media, where we have seen all kinds of speculation about Yemen's future, including the possibility that Yemen is poised to become the next Afghanistan, a failed state. And we have also seen an increased response uh, from the U.S. government, which has made counterterrorism one of the pivots of its uh, engagement with Yemen and one of the central elements of its overall policy with Yemen more broadly. Now, whether counterterrorism should be the pivot of U.S. policy in Yemen, and if it is, what kind of counterterrorism policy uh, is most appropriate for a country like Yemen, uh, which faces quite an extraordinary range of challenges, uh, and where by all accounts, uh, or by many accounts, the numbers of al-Qaeda in the country remain relatively low, are very important questions for U.S. policymakers, and the reason why the Yemen Working Group at the U.S. Institute of Peace, which I direct, I'm Steve Heidemann, uh, decided to focus our session this morning on the question of counterterrorism in U.S. policy in Yemen and as a component of U.S. policy more broadly uh, toward Yemen. And I can literally think of no one more qualified to address the subject of counterterrorism in Yemen than our speaker today, uh, Ambassador Daniel <coughs> Benjamin, who is the State Department's coordinator for counterterrorism. Uh, counterterrorism is, is a subject that Ambassador Benjamin has focused on for much of the past 20 decades in a variety of different capacities. Now, nah, 22 decades, 20 years, excuse me. <laughs> you, you, you're very well preserved. <laughs> Two decades. Two decades. Uh, as a journalist, he has written two books on the subject. Uh, he has held a variety of senior positions relating to counterterrorism, both in and out of government, as a member of the staff of the National Security Council, as a foreign policy speechwriter and advisor to President Clinton, as director of counterterrorism in the Office of Transnational Threats, uh, so this is uh, a, a specialist on counterterrorism, I think, without peer uh, in Washington and in the U.S. government. And, and we're, we're delighted to have him here to comment on where counterterrorism fits in U.S. policy toward Yemen. I'm also especially pleased to have Ambassador Benjamin here because among his many impressive accomplishments, uh, is his um, tenure as a former USIP senior fellow. Uh, Ambassador Benjamin spent 2,000 here as a Jennings Randolph Fellow. We're always particularly pleased to welcome our alumni back to USIP, especially after they have made good. And so please welcome uh, Ambassador Benjamin. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for that kind introduction and uh, for uh, clearly designating me as the Methuselah of CT specialists. Um, however, I'll return to my regular age now, if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> anyway, it's a great pleasure to be at, at USIP. Uh, again, always a pleasure to be in this room. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, you and the uh, Institute's uh, uh, Yemen Working Group for uh, the invitation. I'm delighted to see colleagues who I think uh, would have every bit as much to contribute to this subject right in the front row. Ambassador Barbara Bodine, who was one of my predecessors, as well as Ambassador in Yemen, and, and Ambassador Steve Krajewski. Um, and there are many other people here, I'm sure, who, who could say just as much uh, 
of, of, uh, of value. Um, <clears throat> let me say um, it's also a particular pleasure to be at the Institute uh, because of the role it played in my career, which you, which you mentioned. Uh, and it gave me a home after I left uh, the NSC uh, at the end of 1999. That was really a critical opportunity for me to work through some of the ideas that I was developing about why uh, Al-Qaeda uh, and its brand of terror was distinctive from what we had seen before. Um, and uh, it really was uh, an extraordinary, extraordinarily valuable uh, experience for which I will always be grateful. I also want to say that... Uh, uh, working where I do now, I see your new building quite frequently. Uh, it's extraordinarily beautiful. We very much look forward to having you in the neighborhood and having uh, even more convenient conversations like this. So uh, uh, I hope you'll be kind enough to invite me to uh, recapitulate this speech there. Um, I'm sure many of you saw the recent uh, Washington Post story uh, claiming that government officials now rank al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula uh, and specifically in Yemen, is the most urgent threat to United States security, even a greater threat uh, than the al-Qaeda core in Pakistan. Let me just say for the record uh, that we have no such rankings and such statements are of little value except to highlight a threat. Terrorism emanating from Yemen is a major security concern for the United States, but the al-Qaeda core in Pakistan remains an extraordinarily formidable and dangerous terrorist organization whose targeting of the United States continues despite the pressure that the group is under in the uh, federally administered uh, tribal areas. As we've seen over the last year, though, I think it's also important to note that the threat, the terrorist threat, continues to evolve in ways that make a purely geographical focus um, um, less and less important. So we need to put away uh, the ranking tables and, f and uh, turn our attention specifically to the danger and the nature of the threat. Uh, let me also uh, make clear um, what many of you, and certainly Ambassador Bodine knows uh, very, very well. Um, Yemen isn't a new security concern. Al-Qaeda has had a presence in Yemen since at least December 1992 when it carried out what was probably the first of Al-Qaeda's uh, attacks uh, when it attempted to bomb in a hotel in Aden where American personnel were staying. Uh, those troops, you may recall, were en route to Somalia to support the UN mission there. This was almost eight years before the uh, bombing of the USS Cole. Um, Al-Qaeda has really always had a foothold in Yemen, and it has always been a major concern in the United States, always, that is to say, as long as there's been an Al-Qaeda. Um, in the 1990s, a series of major conspiracies were based in Yemen, most of them aimed at Saudi Arabia. Following the attack on the Cole, the Yemeni government, with support from the United States, dealt significant blows to Al-Qaeda. Uh, in Yemen through uh, military operations and the arrests of key leaders. What is important today is that December, the December 25th conspiracy demonstrated that at least one al-Qaeda affiliate, uh, AQAP, has developed not just the desire but also the capability to launch strikes against the United States in the homeland. The gravity of the AQAP threat was clear to the Obama administration from day one, and it has been focused on Yemen since the outset. In the spring of 2009, the administration initiated a full-scale review of our Yemen policy. That review led to a new whole-of-government approach to Yemen that aims to coordinate uh, our counterterrorism uh, efforts uh, as well as our, our non-counterterrorism uh, efforts with those of other international actors. Our new strategy seeks to address the root causes of instability and to improve governance. And central to this approach is building the capacity of Yemen's government to exercise its authority and deliver security and services to its people. To advance this strategy, we've engaged consistently and intensively with our Yemeni counterparts at the highest levels, I might add. Senior administration, civilian and military officials, including Deputy National Security Advisor John Brennan, Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs Jeff Feltman, Assistant Secretary, I'm sorry, former CENTCOM Commander David Petraeus uh, and myself have all visited Yemen uh, to discuss how we can jointly confront the threat of Al Qaeda. We've put an unprecedented priority on Ye Yemeni issues, Yemeni issues, and continue to engage with a broad array of Yemenis from the government and from civil society. Recently, as many of you know, uh, the National Defense University hosted a group of uh, Yemeni officials for two weeks. And I can tell you that uh, uh, 
an unprecedented number of senior representatives from numerous U.S. agencies met with the group while they were here. Uh, I actually met with them twice. And just last week, I met again with representatives from a uh, Yemeni human rights organization. I've seen a lot of press pieces and think tank papers that discuss the need to deal with AQAP not just through security means, but through a wide range of other efforts. What I haven't seen yet is much discussion of how we're doing just that. Of course we're working on the security issues. We would be negligent in our responsibilities to the American public if we were not. However, we're also putting significant effort and resources into helping Yemenis achieve a more stable, peaceful, prosperous, prosperous and democratic Yemen. So are other bilateral and multilateral players, and we are also working to find uh, ways to improve these efforts. But they are real, and they should be recognized. Yemen's future is tied to its neighbors and to others in the global community. I already mentioned AQAP's ambition to strike the United States at home. Within the Gulf, AQAP has, al has already shown itself to be a formidable threat to Yemen itself, with many recent attacks on security services throughout the country, and it continues to target Saudi Arabia, including the attempted attack against uh, the Assistant uh, Minister, Minister of the Interior and, and Counterterrorism Chief uh, Prince Mohammed bin Nayef. While terrorism knows no borders, we must also be mindful of the regional dimension of the AQAP threat, including its ties with Somalia. The large refugee population from Somalia amplifies the historic ties between these two states, and we know that the vast majority of these connections are not related to terrorism, but rather uh, are a matter of economic migration or Somali refugees fleeing political strife. But clearly there are connections across the Gulf of Aden between extremists, and they are a concern. Yes, Somalia's al-Shabaab is a different kind of organization from AQAP in Yemen in many ways. It's much more focused on a Somalia-centered uh, agenda, while AQAP continues to pursue a more classical al-Qaeda course of global terrorism. Even so, we see a serious threat to regional stability in the connections between these groups, and that gives greater urgency to our work against AQAP and to support the constructive forces of moderation and peace in Somalia. What is critical today is that the government of Yemen is fully aware of the threat emanating from AQAP. It has conducted multiple operations designed to disrupt AQAP's uh, planning and deprive its leadership of safe haven within Yemeni territory. These security operations may over time weaken the enemy's leadership and deny it the time and space it needs to organize, plan, and train for operations. At the same time, countering violent extremism in Yemen over the long term must involve the development of credible institutions that can, develop, uh, can deliver real economic and social progress. That's why our strategy in Yemen is twofold. To assist the Yemeni government not only to confront the immediate security concern of AQAP, but also to mitigate the serious political, economic, and governance issues that the country faces. The logic behind the strategy is that while we work with the Yemeni government to constrain and dismantle AQAP, we, along with the international community, will also assist the Yemeni people to build more durable and responsive institutions. Our goal is a more hopeful future and a more capable Yemeni government that will meet more of the needs of its people, a good in itself, but also key for reducing the appeal of violent extremism. In fact, the United States has made capacity building one of the cornerstones of our Yemen policy. In the important areas of security, economic development, and government, governance, the U.S. and its international partners are helping the Yemeni government address the state insufficiencies that are exploited by terrorists. As I mentioned, the United States isn't doing this alone. The international community has been active in helping Yemen address its shortcomings, and our efforts in the country are part of a global partnership to enhance security, and improve governance. We're working with all of Yemen's international partners to better coordinate foreign assistance and to make sure that it has an impact on the ground. Through the Friends of Yemen process, the United States is engaged with international partners, including regional states, and we're working with the government of Yemen to help address a multitude of problems. The Friends of Yemen Forum, launched nine months ago in London, 
has provided an environment for international coordination and created working groups on economy and governance, as well as justice and rule of law issues. The Friends of Yemen are helping Yemen to support a national dialogue and parliamentary elections in 2011. Plan for new courts and an increase in police and judicial process in remote areas. Prepare de-radicalization action plans and renew a push for coordination and improvement in border security. The Friends of Yemen will hold a ministerial meeting later this month in New York on the margins of the UN General Assembly. We're encouraged by the progress to date and we expect further international coordination in this arena. The stability of Yemen is essential as well to the broader Gulf region and to global security. And delegitimizing AQAP also requires addressing Yemen's own challenges to break the cycle of radicalization. AQAP takes advantage of insecurity in various regions of Yemen, which is worsened by internal conflicts and competition for governance by tribal and non-state actors. Yemen's myriad social and political problems in the context of uh, under undergoverned spaces means areas of Yemen are serving as incubators for extremism. The only way to address the problem of terrorism in Yemen is from a comprehensive and long-term perspective. We're working to help strengthen Yemen's capacity pr to provide basic services and good governance. Yemen, as you all know, is grappling with severe poverty. It is the poorest country in the Arab world its per capita income of $930 uh, ranks it 166th out of 174 countries. Its oil production is steadily decreasing. Water resources are fast being depleted. And with over half of the people living in poverty and the population having grown from 8.4 million in 1980 to an estimated 23.8 million today, economic conditions threaten to worsen and further tax the government's already limited capacity. Moreover, corruption is all too prevalent in various sectors and further impedes the ability of the government to provide essential services. Therefore, the United States is providing development assistance to improve governance and help meet pre pressing socioeconomic challenges. USAID has started two development initiatives, a responsive government project and a community livelihoods program. In looking to tackle the areas that are most in need and most vulnerable to extremism, U.S. assistance includes political and fiscal reforms, reducing corruption and implementing civil service reform, and economic diversification to generate employment. In addition, the Middle East Partnership Initiative, MEPI, is working with Yemeni civil society to empower Yemenis to build a more peaceful and prosperous future. Let me provide you with some, some numbers. Baseline U.S. assistance to Yemen increased from 17.2 million in fiscal year 2008 to 40.3 million in 2009 and will be around 67.5 million in 2010. The President has request, requested approximately 106.6 in baseline assistance for 2011. These numbers do not include, let me emphasize that, do not include counterterrorism assistance of 67 million in FY 2009 and 150.5 million in 2010, nor do they include humanitarian assistance. On July 24th, the President announced an increase in U.S. humanitarian assistance to Yemen of 29.6 million, raising the total to 42.5 million for this fiscal year. This assistance will provide food, water, sanitation, shelter, and health care for over 324,000 individuals displaced by the conflict in northern Yemen, as well as refugees in southern Yemen. The United States urges other donors to support international agencies working to meet these urgent humanitarian needs, as the United Nations Humanitarian Response Plan remains woefully underfunded. We're also working internationally to prevent funds from getting to AQAP. As soon as it's, it announced its formation in January 2008, we began gathering evidence to build an international consensus behind designating AQAP under UN Security Council Resolution 1267. After our designation of the group as a foreign terrorist organization and its senior leaders as designated terrorists, the UN announced the designation of AQAP as well 
as its leader, Nasser al-Wahishi and Saad al-Shikri, and more recently, Anwar al-Awlaki on the consolidated list. <clears throat> this, um, this move requires all UN member states to implement an assets freeze, a travel ban, and an arms embargo against these en- entities. With these designations, the U.S. and the international community can curb the financial networks and the freedom of movement of known terrorists. In the case of Anwar al-Awlaki, this designation has made clear his role as an operator in a terrorist group. We should make no mistake about al-Awlaki. This is not just an ideologue, but someone who has been personally involved in planning terrorist operations against Americans, against U.S. interests, and against the homeland. Anwar al-Awlaki prepared Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib for his attempted detonation of a bomb aboard Northwest Airlines Flight 253 on December 25th of last year. In mid-July, Alaki was designated by the Treasury Department under Executive Order 13224 before he was added to the 1267 consolidated list of individuals and entities associated with al-Qaeda or the Taliban. In order to succeed in Yemen, it's vital that we understand how recruits are radicalized, what their motivations are, and how we can address the drivers of radicalization so that we can begin to turn the tide against violent extremism. Some of our aid programs will help address underlying conditions for at-risk populations. Reducing corruption, building legitimate institutions, increasing economic opportunity with our assistance will also reduce the appeal of terror. And we will continue to build positive people-to-people engagement with the people of Yemen through educational and cultural exchanges, programs that have had a multiplier effect as participants return to Yemen and convey to friends and families the realities of American culture and society and dispel damaging and persistent stereotypes. These initiatives contribute to the long-term health of our bilateral relationship and help allay suspicion and misunderstanding. We know the tasks are daunting, and that's why we're looking for new partners from Yemeni civil society to work with us as we deepen our engagement with Yemen in this regard. In addition to such uh, initiatives, we are committed to supporting internal peace within Yemen, and we support international efforts to achieve that goal. A ceasefire is currently in place in the conflict centered in the Sada government of northern, north, uh, northwestern Yemen excuse me, between the central government and the Houthi rebels. Just two weeks ago, Houthi leaders and Yemeni uh, government officials met in Qatar to further discuss implementation of the ceasefire agreement that they reached in February. The U.S. continues to encourage the Yemeni government to move forward toward a lasting peace in Sada, as well as to allow for the provision of humanitarian and development assistance there. In the south of Yemen, a growing protest movement has led to riots and sporadic outbreaks of violence, and it is fueled by longstanding political grievances. The U.S. continues to urge political dialogue and peaceful settlement of grievances to address the many concerns of southern Yemenis. The U.S. also calls for a comprehensive an inclusive national dialogue between all opposition groups and the ruling party. Such a dialogue needs to be undertaken in good faith and with haste by all parties to address legitimate grievances, facilitate successful parliamentary elections in 2011, and increase stability in Yemen. Our strategy recognizes that Yemen has not always had the political will or the focused attention to address its problems. We're working hard with our international partners to address Yemen's security and other challenges. We're encouraged because the Yemeni government has shown more resolve than ever before to confront AQAP and to engage with the international community on on domestic non-security issues. The United States commends Yemen on its counterterrorism operations and we are committed to continuing support for security initiatives and economic development initiatives. In closing, let me just reiterate, our approach to the problem of terrorism in Yemen must be comprehensive and it must be sustained. It must take into account a wide range of political, cultural, and socioeconomic factors. Ultimately, the goal of the United States 
and international efforts as a stable, secure, and effectively govern Yemen. We know this is a long-term challenge. We've taken some steps since this administration came into office and we have taken uh, toward that goal and we have taken some towards curtailing the threat. As the government of Yemen grows more transparent and more responsive to the requirements of its citizens, the seeds of extremism and violence will find less fertile ground and a more positive and productive dynamic will begin to prevail. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much both for that very sort of thorough overview of U.S. policy, but also for a very interesting diagnosis of the range of, of problems that, that Yemen confronts. Uh, we will soon move to questions and answers from the floor. We are webcasting this event and have welcomed questions from uh, those who are uh, hearing or viewing the, um, the event on the web. We understand that the U.S. Embassy in Yemen has assembled a number of, um, of people to, to uh, hear um, what Ambassador Benjamin had to say, and so we may find some questions coming from Yemen. Um, just one quick question to, to, to get things started. You mentioned that we have requested support from the government of Yemen to deal with uh, issues of governance that seem to be contributing to conditions of alienation and conflict within the country. Could you be a little bit more specific beyond national dialogue, which you referred to and which I, is, is clearly important, about what we have asked from the government of Yemen and in particular how they have responded in, 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 in as concrete uh, a way as you feel, feel able to do so? Sure. Well, um, obviously this is an important part of the discussion and uh, U.S. interlocutors raise it, um, you know, at every, uh, at every juncture because we know that governance is really uh, at the very heart of uh, the country's problems but also of the problems of radicalization in many different um, contexts uh, around the world and especially uh, wherever we find uh, un- and undergoverned uh, spaces. Why don't I just uh, leave this by, by saying because – these are government-to-government -government discussions um, that, you know, the, the Yemenis have, have welcomed uh, AID's govern, governance uh, program. Um, we have found many um, positive and, and willing and committed interlocutors and, and implementers as well because AID, of course, is using lots of different uh, partners on the ground. Uh, the Middle East Partnership Initiative is also uh, active in this space. And I think that we are hopeful that over the long term, uh, these many different uh, seeds will uh, bear real fruit. Um, I think that one of the things that perhaps wasn't captured in, in my remarks enough, and that, um, but it's important to keep in mind, is that for a number of years uh, in this decade, you know, our engagement was quite minimal. So we know where we are starting from uh, on this and related issues. And, um, you know, it's important to keep that historical context in mind uh, as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Questions? Sir? If you, uh, we have microphones on the side, and if you could identify yourself um, in advance of asking your question. Um, I'm Hussein Al Hussein with the Kuwaiti newspaper, all right. Um, I see that you focused uh, on the AQAP but somehow left out uh, uh, the reports on Iran and the Lebanese Hezbollah training and then arming uh, the Houthis in the north. Uh, are these reports credible by any means? Thanks. Uh, we have seen the reports, um, and as I and uh, Assistant Secretary Feltman and others have said on numerous occasions, uh, we are unable to confirm them. We do not um, – we have not seen that these have been uh, borne out. Eli Lake from the Washington Times. Mr. Ambassador, can you give your assessment of the security of Yemeni prisons in the event that the U.S. would transfer uh, detainees from Guantanamo to Yemen? Do you trust Yemeni jails to keep detainees from Guantanamo detained? Well, obviously, we've had some um, well-known jailbreaks, and they have actually uh, contributed to the uh, problem of um, – AQAP in the region. 
as you know, right now the administration is, has suspended uh, the return of uh, Guantanamo detainees uh, to Yemen, except in cases uh, where the courts have ruled on habeas corpus uh, petitions. Um, it is an issue that we are concerned about, that we are talking to the Yemenis about, and that uh, has also been brought up in the context of the Friends of Yemen, and we understand that uh, this is an area in which improvements uh, clearly need to be made and in which, uh, you know, in a very serious way, uh, U.S. security is affected. So uh, we are looking at, at it, looking at it now, and as I mentioned, we are not returning any uh, more detainees uh, at, this, at this time. Mr. Ambassador, my name is Mohammed Kardar from CSIS. Uh, you spoke of uh, that you were you mentioned that you were looking for civil uh, partners in civil society of Yemen um, to aid in these efforts. I was wondering if you could speak to sort of, uh, how that search is going, as well as to the potential role that civil society actors in the U.S. and, and around the world could play. Um, and specifically, if, if you would consider, or there has been consideration of including Yemen in the um, economic empowerment strategic regions uh, part of that. Uh, State. Uh, you know, it's a wise man who knows when he's out of his lane, and I'm going to refer you to my colleagues at AID. I know that uh, whenever I am speaking to uh, Yemenis, uh, I'm confronted with any number of new uh, NGOs that uh, I had not known of before, and I know that AID is working on getting to know these different organizations. Um, and um, uh, I know that my colleagues uh, seem to be optimistic about the opportunities for, for working in Yemen, uh, but as the counterterrorism coordinator, I can't give you the uh, the day-to-day -day on which uh, organizations are looking hopeful and which aren't, so I would suggest you contact AID. Hi, uh, Chris Trey Anders from the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, we've been very concerned about the targeted killing program, and um, I was wondering if you'd be able to comment on the targeted killing program as it relates to Yemen and to al -Aki. Um And in particular, we've been very concerned about the government's refusal up to this point about disclosing legal justification um, for the program as well as what the criteria are for getting off or on it, which really is kind of the core of the UN Rapporteur on extrajudicial killings critique of the program. Well, thanks for that question. Um, as you know, um, uh, ACLU has, has brought suit on this issue, and we are currently in court on, on this matter. And I learned a long time ago not to comment on ongoing litigation um, for any number of, uh, of good bureaucratic and uh, legal reasons. So I'm going to refer you to my colleague, uh, Harold Coe, the legal advisor. Um, let me just say about uh, Anwar al Awlaki that, uh, underscoring what I said before, uh, this is not just an ideologue. This is an active terrorist, and um, uh, the United States is committed to preventing harm from being done uh, to its citizens by those uh, who uh, would commit, commit acts of violence against us. Thanks. Ambassador, I'm Howard Sumka. I'm the Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Middle East at USAID, and I can't answer his question, but... Uh, the, number, the numbers that I have, I, I appreciated to run through the budgets. Our numbers are more or less the same. I think the, the important point is to note that for USAID figures, since 2008, we've gone from about 11 or 12 million, aiming toward about 94 million in fiscal 2010, which reflects the, the um, community livelihoods program, as well as the governance program, as well as a very serious monitoring and evaluation effort that we're undertaking, try to understand what works. My, my question for you is how you see the interface between counterterrorism actions, which are immediate, which are addressed to deal with the threats that we might face in the very near future, with the, the longer term requirements that these kinds of projects have. It, it's not possible, as you know, to build a community, to create good governance, to increase livelihoods um, in, the, in, in, in the immediacy of a, of a terrorism threat, but rather these are two-year, five-year, ten-year programs that require extensive development. Well, um, first of all, let me refer you to the earlier gentleman who wants to talk about NGOs in, <laughs> um, uh, in Yemen that uh, we partner with. But... Um, you know, you, you raise uh, an, an important question. It really goes to the very heart of what we're trying to do and how closely interwoven these uh, these different uh, efforts have to be. Um, 
you know, development is not going to proceed if there is no security. We know that that's uh, absolutely true, but we also know that uh, if we can't get development uh, uh, projects going, then uh, we have abandoned the field uh, to uh, extremists, and they will find, uh, you know, ample pickings uh, if, uh, if that is the case. Um, and that's really been the president's uh, approach uh, throughout, and he has – uh, really uh, tasked us repeatedly to keep working and keep finding more ways in which we can address uh, a fairly grave economic and social situation in um, in Yemen. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there's no walking away from it. Um, we know that uh, um, the uh, uh, the demographic uh, bulge that Yemen has experienced, uh, the decline in its uh, you know, economic output, especially in the hydrocarbon sector, um, all these things, the water, the water table, all these things are, uh, you know, uh, very, very serious indicators of a very troubled future. And the demographic, you know, we've seen a leveling off in many Muslim-majority countries of uh, birth rates. Um, in, in Yemen, the story is still quite uh, dramatic, and the projections 20, 30 years down the line are, are quite – uh, striking. So um, we do need to um, work together as one government, and um, uh, I think that we also need to, uh, and we are working to improve that that connection where also um, our development efforts are specifically addressing uh, radicalization. And, uh, you know, around the world, I think uh, development communities are recognizing how that really does fall within their within their ambit and that um, governments are going to look to them to be able to target those um, uh, particular problem areas and, and work on them. So, Thank you. Before we uh, – You can't stop the New York Times. I'm sorry. You, you, we can't. <laughs> Sir, ah. we have a couple of questions from uh, both the website and, and the overflow room, and let me just pass on a couple of them to you now. Um, Tony Capaccio from Bloomberg asks, uh, in terms of Al Awlaki, when did you conclude he was an active planner and not just an ideologue? Is there a is this a recent judgment? Uh, that's uh, a good question, and I um, would have to uh, go back through my own um, papers to find out when we when we made this conclusion. But it was certainly clear in the aftermath uh, of December 25th. Uh, that he had played an integral role in the planning uh, and the execution of uh, the attempted bombing of uh, Flight 253. And um, um, as I said, we did have the designation this summer, so uh, my guess is that uh, we were somewhere in that period. I can't rule out the possibility that we – we certainly knew that he was um, a problematic individual – uh, last year, and his presence on the web and, and uh, elsewhere uh, has been widely attested to. Of course, he came to light as well in, um, in the Fort Hood case. So um, his role has been um, well attested to. The question is when we actually uh, decide that he was not in one category but in the other. And um, I would have to place it earlier this year, but I couldn't say with certainty. One other question uh, focuses on different conceptions of counterterrorism policy. What you've presented here today is a very expansive definition of counterterrorism in which the kinetic dimensions are complemented by attention to a wide range of economic, social, and political concerns. How widely accepted is that definition of counterterrorism within U.S. government agencies? Where are the fault lines in conceptions of counterterrorism? And how are different visions being addressed in the interagency process? We could talk all day about that. Um, I think the um, important thing is that there is a wide agreement across uh, the government uh, in all the relevant agencies um, that, uh, as um, John, Bren John Brennan put it uh, in a speech at CSIS, um, a while ago, you know, you have to also look at the upstream factors. Now, we as a government face an interesting uh, dilemma um, because we don't want to fall into the trap of saying that everything we do is counterterrorism because um, that is not productive. 
and uh, we don't want everyone who we engage with to feel like they are uh, a target because um, everything we're doing is because of counterterrorism. As I mentioned before, we support a strong and capable Yemeni state, unified state that is uh, answering to the needs of its people because that's a good in its own right. Uh, but I think we also recognize that there are many things that we do that have uh, benefits uh, that encountering radicalization, encountering violent extremist organizations. So um, uh, to a certain extent, you know, the question becomes, well, what do you label uh, counterterrorism? What do you label countering violent extremism? What do you label just good governance? And um, labeling exercises uh, can often be scholastic and counterproductive. Uh, the key thing is that we have to have the right focus, and we recognize that uh, – uh, it's more than uh, kinetics. It's more than law enforcement. It's more than uh, border security. Um, it's also getting uh, these very complex uh, situations in places like Yemen, uh, in Somalia, and a lot of other uh, areas that have uh, real governance problems and where the writ of the government may be limited. Uh, it's in addressing those uh, broader issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Eric Schmidt with The New York Times. Uh, at the end of the last administration, there were proposals being discussed about creating a, essentially a rehabilitation center in Yemen modeled after what the Saudis have done somewhat successfully in terms of religious reorientation, job training, uh, and putting the onus back on tribes and families, of course. What, what has happened to that initiative in this administration, whether it, I understand the, the, you know, the limitations of the U.S. government trying to push this through, but either working through the Saudis or the Friends of Yemen, this would seem to be a constructive way of trying to deal with at least some of the lower security type uh, detainees that are at Gitmo. Uh, thanks for that, Eric. Um, it is um, – we continue to have uh, active discussions on what we can do uh, in terms of rehabilitation in Yemen. Uh, and uh, um, the Saudi um, model is a very attractive one. There are discussions going on within the Friends of Yemen and in other uh, fora on this matter. I think one of the things to keep in sight of, however, uh, is that the there are aspects of the Saudi model that are, are very much Saudi-specific. Um, to look at uh, two of them, one is that, you know, the Saudi model is very much um, uh, configured to – um, take advantage of the relationship between individuals, families, and tribes. Not all of Yemen is uh, as uh, tribally oriented, I guess you could say, as Saudi Arabia, so that is one uh, important difference. Another absolutely critical difference is that Yemen doesn't have the kind of resources to put into this effort that a Saudi Arabia does. In fact, very, very, very few countries uh, do. And when we look at um, all of the different issues that need to be addressed in dealing with the terrorist threat in Yemen, uh, you have to prioritize as well. So rehabilitation remains an important issue, um, but I, I don't know that we uh, would be able to uh, get to that kind of rehabilitation facility, at least uh, not immediately. We had two questions from the overflow room relating to U.S plans for its military role in uh, Yemen. One from John Bennett of the Defense News who asks, what are the odds on a 1, 100, 1 to 100 scale that U.S. troops will be needed in Yemen, meaning thousands or hundreds of thousands? The related question uh, is, can you go into more detail from uh, Jeff Heinz at American University? Can you go into more detail about how U.S. military involvement will evolve over the long term in Yemen? Um, well, let me try to answer both of those uh, at once. Uh, I think the, uh, the president has been quite clear in ruling out that kind of military engagement uh, in Yemen if we're talking about you know, major combat forces. I think he's been quite explicit about that, and I don't see anyone contemplating that. Um, uh, any time in the foreseeable future. So um, we will continue uh, to be actively engaged in uh, training Yemeni forces to deal with the threats uh, that they face uh, and, uh, you know, getting them the equipment uh, that they need and the 
uh, and the skills, and um, that will be the uh, you know the key military effort. Um, and it goes on in a military channel, but it, there's also uh, an awful lot going on in terms of training civilian uh, authorities um, uh, in the in the Ministry of uh, the Interior, so that they can also deal with the counterterrorism mission. So it's, there's both a military and a civilian side to it. No one to one hundred. You're not willing to. <laughs> I'm going to pass on that and consign it to the same um, waste bin as uh, you know U.S. news type tables on on the uh, Al Qaeda threat. Where is it worst and where is it best? Uh, viewers on the website had uh, two related questions, and and we can we can take these as as the last of our questions unless there are others from the audience. I would encourage you to move to the microphones if if you have them. Uh, the first is uh, from a viewer from Gaston Mennonite University who asks, how do you see Yemen stability contributing to Middle East stability more broadly? What are the linkages there? Uh, and the second has to do with what capacity Yemen seems to have uh, in being a source for export of terrorists uh, um, under the Al-Qaeda brand more broadly and in particular into sensitive areas in Africa across the Horn. Um, okay, the uh, Yemeni role in broader Middle East stability. Um, obviously, it's it's quite important. Um, I think that it's fair to say that um, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, is deeply concerned and understandably so about the terrorist threat uh, to its south. And um, having suffered the uh, the traumas of uh, of May 2003 and the attacks there has has really been resolved to um, uh, uh, to remove uh, violent extremism uh, from the Arabian Peninsula and uh, has been has been a terrific partner to the United States in that context and has also been a great partner together on um, uh, on Yemeni issues. Uh, obviously, anything that would affect security for uh, Saudi Arabia uh, has a very significant um, – it's a matter of great uh, significance and concern for anyone who cares about the stability of the region. In terms of um, uh, the whole region also, you know, to the extent that AQAP can maintain a foothold and be a source of um, of extremist ideology but also extremist – uh, operatives, uh, it is a danger to the region, and uh, you know there are um, there are Yemeni communities in many different uh, areas uh, in the Gulf, uh, across the water in uh, Djibouti, uh, and uh, and any number of other places, and uh, it will be a great concern. And of course, uh, there are Yemeni diasporas around the world, and hence when you find uh, some of the uh, Shall we say culturally savvy operators like an al uh like some other um, people who uh, were either American citizens or lived for uh, quite a while here in the United States, uh, and who can uh, broadcast that message in, um, uh, in a sort of idiomatic way and, and appeal in a way that uh, uh, Al Qaeda operatives who were uh, working through translation couldn't. Then obviously that's a big concern uh, for us. Um, uh, there's no question that Alaki himself has had a uh, an effect uh, on radicalization in the in the English speaking world um, uh, that goes beyond what his predecessors had. So um, it it is a matter of uh, of great concern. Uh, again, to to uh, repeat what I said before, he's also a terrorist operative. He's not just someone who's making use of the opportunities uh, afforded by uh, free speech over the internet. Um, so he's a matter of great concern to the United States. But um, the ability to use Yemen as a platform uh, for uh, radicalization, uh, especially in an ever more globalized, uh, connected uh, electronic world, is, uh, is something we are worried about. You reference Saudi Arabia and Saudi stability as uh, a principal consideration in thinking about connections between Yemen and the region more broadly. You didn't reference Iran and Yemen's repeated um, 
claims that Iran has played a role in the Houthi rebellion in the north in support of Houthi forces. Uh, what is the current thinking uh, in your office about Iran's role in this region? Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, we don't see an Iranian hand in, the, uh, uh, in Sada, in the Houthi rebellion. Um, obviously, one would like not to repeat the whole point so often that, that Iranians start to wonder whether they should be uh, involved. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, to this point, we have seen um, lots of accusations, but we have not seen uh, we have not seen the evidence. So that has not changed from that has not changed over the past several months. Thank you. Hi, uh, Les Campbell from the National Democratic Institute or NDI. Um, I noted your comments about the importance of better governance in Yemen, both uh, to bring uh, better livelihoods as well as uh, potentially build institutions and capacity, and, and certainly would agree with that. Um, I, I guess a, a comment and a question. One comment I would make is that the Yemen government is also suffering from uh, perhaps uh, declining legitimacy, and different reasons for that. One is that uh, Southerners uh, increasingly, and I think you, you also addressed this, increasingly would like to, uh, in a sense, renegotiate the terms of unity, and, and that has caused uh, unrest as well as a perception of, uh, of perhaps the government, uh, the, the central government, not treating the South well. The Houthi rebellion... Um, caused for different reasons, perhaps uh, um, more selfish reasons from the Houthis, though, has kind of contributed to this idea of a government that's lacking legitimacy. And finally, um, you know, perhaps uh, good news, a, a, an increasingly assertive and organized opposition uh, has drawn attention to things like a legitimacy uh, debate. Uh, President Saleh uh, perhaps is trying to groom his son. Uh, there are other pretenders for, for, the, for the presidency and so on. And I just wonder if you have any view or if you can express a view on the um, importance of, uh, you mentioned that the planned 2011 election, parliamentary election, um, but, uh, and I don't want to concentrate on that election, but the importance of political processes that are seen to be fair and inclusive. Um, you've mentioned the dialogue with opposition parties, but, uh, for example, on the election, um, would you, could you comment on the importance of an election that is, uh, that is carried out with agreed-upon rules and in a transparent way uh, that could perhaps start to address some of these legitimacy questions around the government? <clears throat> well, uh, I, I think your, uh, your question sets the table very well. Obviously, it's essential for Yemen to have uh, free and fair elections, uh, to have agreed-upon uh, rules of, of the road. I, I think that the national dialogue is essential. Uh, Ambassador Sesh, who uh, just... Uh, uh, finished his tour, worked very hard on uh, promoting uh, this goal. Um, obviously, you know, we're, we're going to have a hard time getting from here to there uh, if we do not emphasize uh, the governance uh, aspect of this. And, um, you know, we have uh, spoken, the Secretary at the, at the Friends of Yemen uh, conference made a point of underscoring the need for a unified Yemen. That this is Uh, Actually, to come back to your question earlier, this is absolutely essential for uh, regional stability and for the, uh, I think, the 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 future of the Yemeni people. Um, And um, anything that promotes any of these divisive tendencies will be, uh, you know, harmful both to the people of Yemen but also to uh, security in the Gulf and beyond. So. I, I can't do more than, than uh, underscore how important it is uh, that the April elections uh, do go well and that um, uh, we make uh, progress, the Yemenis make progress in, uh, in bridging these divides, which uh, uh, have in the past also had a very negative uh, effect in terms of uh, diverting attention uh, from the threat of extremism within the country. So um, I, I think there's uh, an abundance of reasons why uh, the political process needs to uh, continue in a positive way. Alan Kieswetter with Middle East Alan. Institute at CU and CNL Resources. Um, Tom Friedman this week had a column uh, called uh, Superpower Super Broke, talking about the U.S. And if I do my arithmetic correctly, the U.S. aid programs are two to, uh, two to three hundred million dollars a year this year. And that's about the number of uh, al-Qaeda agents estimated in the press, at least, of being there. 
And the prescription uh, is wholesale reform of the society. I'm sorry, how many al-Qaeda? Uh, the press I've read it said two to three hundred, but maybe it's more. Oh, I thought you said 200, 300 million. No, 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 no. <laughs> two to three hundred. My job got a lot tougher. <laughs> About a million dollars a piece is oh. the point. Uh, and uh, the prescription is a fairly wholesale change of Yemeni society and long-term trends, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I guess this is a conceptual question. Uh, is there any thinking in the, uh, in the CT community about approaches that are not so expensive and that may be more affordable? Well, let me turn your question a little bit on its head and say that I think that this is actually um, the more affordable way of going um, in comparison to many of our other uh, uh, assistance programs. This is uh, still not that large compared to uh, what we have to deal with when a country um, is broken, as in uh, the case of an Iraq or an Afghanistan. This is um, really a very, very small Amount. I would underscore, um, as the President and as uh, the Secretary have, that this is a matter for the international community, and there are an awful lot of uh, countries that have recognized uh, this challenge and are, um, uh, uh, you know, showing their commitment with their pocketbooks. Uh, it's a very uh, difficult time. Uh, obviously for us, I think that right now you could argue that um, – our British friends are um, are on a on a very very uh, uh, difficult course of uh, austerity, but they're maintaining their commitment to Yemen and uh, in, and may be increasing it. Um, there are uh, regional actors who um, have very deep pockets who uh, we continue to uh, encourage to do what is necessary in Yemen. Um, whenever you get to the point where um, you have to use kinetic force, things get a lot more expensive. That's the first thing. And um, if there are many other uh, options other than um, waiting till you're sort of at the point of delivery of a terrorist attack and dealing with it then or stopping it uh, earlier on, I'm I'm eager to hear them if you had any any particular suggestions. Of course, we continue to work uh, aggressively on all the different homeland security uh, programs that will restrict terrorist travel. That was one of the uh, um, one of the conclusions or one of the uh, initiatives that uh, came out of December 25th. That we had to redouble our efforts on that, particularly in an era of very uh, inventive uh, terrorist conspiracies, in which people who had no uh, prior uh, records, who were not in the uh, usual databases, uh, were being deployed against us. So. Um, Obviously, uh, you know, we don't like spending lots of money if we don't have to, but uh, this is a a key security matter and also a key uh, global issue. So um, uh, we'll continue to uh, – we'll continue to pay uh, and to uh, appropriate funds uh, as necessary. And I think the Congress has also seen the the wisdom of taking this course. So um, if you have that third way, I'm eager to hear about it. And uh, otherwise, I'm afraid we've got the strategy we've got for now. It is not common for Yemeni citizens to have the chance to interact with senior U.S. officials. I have two questions from uh, people who've identified themselves as citizens of Yemen. Let me just pose those to you. Uh, First, does the U.S. speak with one voice in Yemen? Who has the upper hand over the Yemeni file, the CIA or the State Department? Uh, I suspect many Yemenis uh, probably wonder that. The second is, uh, did the U.S. military give Yemen or Saudi any assistance against the al-Houthi rebels? Uh, Let me answer the second question first with a categorical uh, no on um, kinetic assistance. Um, We are not involved in that party. in In that conflict, we have... Uh, told them, uh, we have told the Yemenis repeatedly that uh, the provision of military supplies um, is uh, strictly related to the al-Qaeda threat and not to be used elsewhere, and we have very um, uh, very comprehensive end-use monitoring. Um, there was, of course, an attack against uh, Saudi um, forces that went across uh, the border, 
uh, I, that is to say, Houthi forces that went across the border and attacked uh, Saudis. Um, so in that particular case, although I don't have the specifics in front of me, the Saudis would certainly be uh, well within their rights to use whatever um, we had um, uh, delivered to them in terms of uh, military assistance over the years. Um, so let me just be clear about uh, that one. Uh, there is only one U.S. government policy in Yemen. Uh, it is hammered out in the interagency process in which um, the State Department uh, the Defense Department, the intelligence community, and others all participate in. There isn't anyone that has uh, an upper voice. If anyone has a dominant voice, it's the president, and he's been quite clear that he wants to see this two-pronged strategy uh, proceed with all uh, possible haste. And, sir, I think you have the last question for our session. Hi, I'm Sid Mahanto at Mother Jones Magazine. Um, I wondered uh, how human rights abuses on the part of the uh, Yemeni government uh, would contribute to radicalization and perhaps undermine an effective counterterror strategy in Yemen. Um, human rights abuses uh, are a driver of radicalization. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I had the opportunity to deliver um, the U.S. view on that. Uh, in a meeting at the uh, UN Security Council earlier this year, were quite categorical that um, that human rights abuses, together with poor governance, the non-delivery of services, all these things are drivers of radicalization. And um, uh, it is for that reason that we communicate to our international partners and those we work with on counterterrorism uh, all the time uh, that this is a key part of uh, dealing with their threat. Um, when we do lots of different kinds of counterterrorism training uh, around the world, whether it's through the anti-terrorism assistance program that my office uh, runs jointly with diplomatic security, or whether it's with any number of other uh, kinds of assistance that are uh, delivered, we include human rights training uh, so that our partners understand just how vital it is uh, to uh, maintain uh, standards, to avoid anything that will violate uh, human rights. And uh, that is something that we do because it is uh, appropriate in its own right, but also because we are concerned about how it will contribute to radicalization. And this is something my office is very concerned about. I believe it's something that the Department of Defense is concerned about. Uh, there's now a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Rights uh, at DOD, something there wasn't before. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's part of the whole policy. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. And um, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ambassador Benjamin, thank you very much. Before you uh, leave for the day, uh, on behalf of the Institute, you have not only our thanks, but I wanted to give you a copy of a very recent USIP publication, uh, Crescent and Dove, Peace and Conflict Resolution in Islam. We hope that you will find ways you to much. make it useful in your work. With our right. thanks again for your insights into a very complex set of challenges we're wrestling with in the Many U.S. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.